The Old West was a time full of violence and gunfights. Until today, it rules our fantasy, as you can see in a never-ending stream of Western movies. Many shooters of the modern day grew up with these films, so that's no wonder that lever-action rifles, single-action revolvers, and cowboy action shooting is in high demand. Let's take a look at the five greatest gunfights of the Old West. This is not just for nostalgia. It should be remembered that a citizen-involved shooting of today is more akin to the shooting of the Wild West than some of the commando scenarios some tactical hobos have in mind. Granted, the scale might be smaller than these great gunfights, but in the end, the one who draws and shoots faster and also hits wins. The great fight between Wild Bill Hillcock and Dave Tutt on July 21, 1865 on the town square of Springfield, Missouri. Dave Tutt was a gambler. As such, you can imagine his activity with James Butler Hickok, also known as Wild Bill Hickok. Tut had more luck in the card game they were playing. At the end of his money, Hickok bet his watch. Again, Tut won again. Hickok, and most probably other fighters of the day, was a rather sore loser. As such, he did not only get angry, he also warned Tut. If the new owner of the watch would so much as only look at it, Hickok would kill him. Tut was not a shy person, did not care about the warning. What followed was a gunfight in the town square. The distance was rather long at 75 yards. There was yet another problem in the form of the law. Who draws first and wins the fight might have to face the hangman afterwards. So instead of going right at it, a game of challenges started. Tut was the first to lose his nerve. The result was that he drew first. What might have been a winning move under different conditions was rather reckless against Hickok, who was indeed skilled with guns. It came as it had to come. Hickok drew two, but he took the time to aim carefully. There are versions of this fight that even mention a fence post that he used as a rest to stabilize his aim. Post or not, Hickok did his best and took the heart of Tut. After that, he took his watch. The O.K. Corral on October 26, 1881 in Tombstone, the Arizona Territory. Who has not seen at least one of the many movies about this fight in Tombstone? The shootout itself took just 30 seconds and happened between lawmen who were led by Virgil Earp and a group of outlaws, just called the Cowboys. The gunfight broke out because of a feud between some of the lawmen and some cowboys. At the start, there were four lawmen against six cowboys. The distance between both groups was just six to ten feet. The lawmen did not expect to fight and kept some of their weapons concealed. On the other side, the cowboys were close to their horses with rifles and their scabbards, and themselves wore belts with revolvers. Virgil, as the leader of the lawmen, challenged the cowboys and ordered them to get their hands up so they could be disarmed. Immediately, the cowboys drew their guns and cocked. Virgil ordered them to stop saying he did not want that. Then, the shooting started. Who fired the first shot is contested, as all was over in 30 seconds. In that short time, 30 rounds were fired. What made the confusion worse is the fact that guns of the day used black powder, what produced quite some smoke, making any kind of observation increasingly difficult. On that day, three men died, and several more were wounded. The Frisco Shootout of December 1, 1884 on the lower San Francisco Plaza in New Mexico. Alfigo Baca was a central protagonist of this great fight. There is a sculpture showing him in the center of reserve in New Mexico to commemorate the great Frisco shootout. The plaque on the sculpture quotes him as saying Texans that he's not afraid of American cowboys. Baca was the sheriff of a town, a position to which he had appointed himself. He wanted to arrest a cowboy, what turned out badly. Not only started said cowboy to shoot at him, he also got some help from 80 of his friends. Widely outnumbered and outgunned, Baca was not the kind of guy to just give up. Instead, he took refuge in an adobe house and planned to defend himself as long as necessary. What followed was a siege that lasted 36 hours. The cowboys fired allegedly 4,000 rounds at the house, of which 400 put holes into it. No round hit Baca. Not shy about his firepower, Baca did not stop himself from firing back. His aim was much better, affording him four kills and a further eight wounded attackers. Unbelievably, Baca managed to survive and died in his bed in the year 1945 at the age of 80. How was that possible? His attackers fired away until they had no ammo left. That was the signal for Baca to stroll out of his refuge totally unscathed. After that, he went on with his career as a lawyer and legislator. The gunfight between Luke Short and long-haired Jim Courtright on February 8, 1887 on Main Street, Fort Worth, Texas. 
Typically, gunfights did need to last long, nor take place over a long distance. So was also this fight a rather close affair. Courtright had a protection racket going on at that time, which became the subject of a quarrel between him and Short. They met on Main Street, Fort Worth, Texas. The distance was a mere length of an arm. Both drew, but Short was able to fire first. His aim was a little off. However, instead of ending the fight, he just shot off the thumb of Courtright's shooting hand. While not necessarily life-threatening, at least not for the next few minutes, Courtright was not able to cock his pistol. In the time of single-action revolvers, that was the same as being completely unable to fire. Staying cool, Courtright had the answer. He swiftly threw his gun into his other hand, a maneuver called border shift. While itself an act of bravery, or maybe a desperation, it was to no avail. Short, undeterred by the problem of his opponent, cocked his gun again and shot again. Without the danger of getting hit himself at any moment, he took careful aim so Courtright had no chance. The Harry Tracy Pursuit of 1902 in Creston, Washington Actually, the Harry Tracy Pursuit was more of a running gun battle than a stationary event. Creston, Washington is not the location it just happened, but the place it ended. It took two months for the law officers of Oregon and Washington to finally win over Harry Tracy. It all started on June 9, 1902, in the Oregon State Penitentiary. On that very day, Tracy managed to escape. While doing so, he killed six people. Three of them were correction officers, and three more were civilians. What followed was a manhunt that can only be described as massive. Tracy was skilled enough, or maybe lucky enough, to evade his pursuers for a month. Then he decided that it was time to do something. What he had in mind was an ambush near Bothell, Washington. When he sprang the ambush, he managed to take down two more lawmen. Not enough. He also took hostages and ran again. This brought about another shootout, by now number three, in which he killed two of his pursuers. This did not deter the posse from coming after him. Quite the contrary, the effort to finally get him was even more increased, leading to the final battle on August 6 near Creston, Washington. Tracy found himself cornered and unable to escape or shoot his way to freedom. Determined not to be captured again, he turned his gun on himself and took his own life. What made Tracy go on and on without even thinking of surrender was, according to some historians, the fact that he could be described as totally crazy. A fight with all the stress and emotions it comes with did not put him under pressure. He actually enjoyed it so that he never made the kind of mistake any other person would surely have made in such a situation. During his fight, he liked to use a 30-30 lever-action rifle in a real Western tradition. With it, he got quite some firepower for each round, but also a good rate of fire compared to other guns of its time. And there you have it, the greatest gunfights of the Wild West. It's interesting to study them, and one or two lessons can be drawn.